We do wait on you, Lord. God, and as I stand before your great, precious people, I pray, Lord, that you speak to our heart concerning contentment. Lord, so that all of us will find satisfaction and fulfillment in our lives, Lord, so that we can find peace. Your grace and your mercy and your strength, O oh God. Lord, I pray that you'll teach us what your will is, what your ways are. Holy Spirit, I ask you today to speak to our hearts, that you will change us. And when we leave this place today, because we met with you, God, we're better. We're going further. We're going to do more than we've ever done before because of you in our hearts and in our lives. So now, Lord, teach us your word. Let us find your strength your real vision for our lives so that we really have purpose and we find fulfillment in you. We pray now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Today I want to talk to you about being content, not being discontent, because when we're discontent in our lives, we get frustrated, we get irritated, we mummer, we gripe, we complain. And really the reason why we're discontent is because our focus is not God. We're focused on ourselves. We're focused on our situation. We're focused on our circumstance. We're focused on the world and the things of the world and the world didn't give it to you so when our focus is wrong when it's looking at anything other than God then we find ourselves discontent in our lives because contentment doesn't come from out here Contentment comes from inside. Fulfillment and satisfaction, the world can't give it to you. Because you want one more. You want a bigger house. You want a faster car. And as soon as you went that fast, you want to go a little bit more faster. It's because the world cannot satisfy or fulfill your life. So when our focus is out here rather than in here with the Lord, then we've, then we've taken our eyes and put it on the wrong thing. Three steps. Stop, look, and fix. When you realize that you are not right, when you're not satisfied, when you're saying the wrong thing in your life, you got to stop. You got to really look because your life comes from what you look at, what you perceive. And what you believe. So if your looking's not right and your perception is not right and your believing 
is not right, then obviously your life will not be right. And so today, I want to look at the scripture. I want to really think about contentment. I want to think about the way that I live my life. Why do I act like I act? Why do I say what I say? And if, and if my focus is wrong, I meaning it's not on God, it's on something in the world, then I'm going to ask you in the name of Jesus Christ to repent. I'm going to ask you to change your focus, your perception, your believing. Because until you change the way you see and the way that you believe and the way that you perceive, you will never, you're stuck, you're hindered, you're staggered, you're stagnated. Because when your perception is not right, you're not moving forward. You're stuck and possibly even moving backwards. Can I tell us that you can't live your life looking through a rear view mirror? You can't live supposedly going this way. But you're constantly looking back. Because it's hard to go forward when you're looking backwards. So here we are. Um, I quoted last week Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So my mind must be renewed. I started there last week. And I'm going to finish these last two scriptures. Verse 31 in Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible says, let all bitterness, let all wrath... And anger. Somebody said, well, what's the difference between raft and anger? The difference is, is raft is like an outburst. Meaning that your anger is manifested where it's it's an outburst. Anger in this scripture is just a consistent, persistent anger. And it has to do with bitterness that's in your heart. Did you know that if you're bitter long enough, you will start to become ugly? It'll just cause your face to get the bitter, lemon-sucking, ugly, the uglies look in your life. How many of you know that life's too short to be bitter? Guys, man, and, and, and what's in you... Is what comes out of you. So if bitterness is in you, God help all the people that come around you. Because your bitterness is coming out of you into them. Your impartation. Listen. In our lives, we give what I call an impartation to people around us. That's why when people die and you're at their funeral, you can ask people to give you stories about that person that died. And I I do this all the time in funerals. And people start telling us who that person was. And the reason why they know who that person was, because that person gave an impartation to everybody that they came around. Listen. You want to make sure that you are filled with God. You're filled with the the wonderful glory of God. Because everywhere you go, you want to give people God. You want to give them an impartation of God's presence, God's power, God's anointing. So can I just say, we got to stay full of the Holy Spirit. we got to be filled with God. Can I get an amen? So bitterness and anger and wrath, clamor. Somebody said, well, man, what in the world uh, is, is clamor? It, it's, um, it's like a boisterousness. It, it's, man, it's, um, it's something to do even like wrath, which is an outburst. It's just loud and boisterous. Evil speaking. Man, guys, 
If you got bitterness in you, then what you speak will not be right. The Bible says to make sure that we put these things away from us. Am I hearing a muffling sound? I'm, I, it just seemed like it just started. <clears throat> so the Bible says put away bitterness, put away uh, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking. Put these things away from you and be ye kind one to another. Quit being hard hearted, but be tender hearted. And listen, a lot of times when we go through things in life, we've had a lot of struggles, we've had a lot of pain in our lives, we've gone through hard things, it has a tendency to make our heart hard. But how many of you know that you've got to allow the Lord to give you a tender heart? You have to have a sweet spirit. You've got to have a quiet, meek spirit that's of great price before the Lord is what the Scripture says. So the Bible says, be tender-hearted. Forgive one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Now, say that with me. Say, Christ has forgiven me. God has forgiven me for Christ's sake. Therefore, I'm forgiven. I extend that forgiveness to others. Release them. Release them. Man, if you won't release someone, you're holding them back. You're holding yourself back. Listen. I say it all the time, forgiveness really doesn't have anything to do with who's right or wrong. Forgiveness has to do with not letting someone else's sin ruin your life or let someone else control you in your life. Because as long as you're holding on to them and won't let them go, you're actually allowing them to control you and put you in bondage. And you ever want to do that. Can I get an amen? All right, let's keep moving. So why do I gripe? Why do I complain? Philippians 1.20. Uh, the, uh, the, the Scripture says this. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, this is Paul, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Somebody said, well, what in the heck did you say, Pastor? I'll tell you. This is the Apostle Paul. He is in jail right now. He doesn't know if he's going to live or die. Look, let me tell you, you think uh, prison is bad now. They had dungeons back in that time. Lots of times they didn't have food. Lots of times they didn't live through the prison experience. And that's what Paul was saying. Paul was saying, look, man, I I got some hope, but I don't know if I'm going to make it through this experience. I'm going through hard times. And he's writing to us and telling us that he has learned to be content in whatsoever situation he's in. Paul is in prison, and he says, I've learned to be content. Are y'all out there? He says, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly. He's in prison. I'm rejoicing. That now at the last your care for me is flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Somebody said, what did you say? It just meant that that the people, the Philippians that had given to Paul before a love offering, They didn't have the opportunity to give him. It says that you lacked opportunity. They didn't have the opportunity to give give him an an offering for whatever reason. But now they've been able to get a hold of Paul and bring him a love offering, and that's where we're going. Not that I speak in respect of want, 
Because I have learned in my life, and I'm in jail right now, that whatsoever state I'm in, I have learned to be content in my life. Because contentment has nothing to do with my surroundings. Contentment has nothing to do with my circumstances. Contentment has nothing to do with my situation. Contentment has to do with what I believe, what I perceive, what I see in my life. Contentment comes from God. Paul says, my focus is on the Lord. Whether I make it out of this jail experience or not, whether they feed me or not, I have learned to be content because I have focused my attention, my heart, my life on God. I'm looking to God in some kind of way in the midst of this hell. I'm finding peace. I'm finding satisfaction. I'm finding fulfillment. I'm finding contentment in my life. So no matter what I'm facing in my life, because I have God, it is well with my soul. All is all right in my life. They can feed me or not. They can kill me or not. In fact, he goes on to say that I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. To abound and to suffer need. Because I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Come on now. My focus is Jesus because of Jesus who strengthens me. And then he says in verse 19, My God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Paul says, listen, my, the God that I serve is, is a supplier. He's a rich God according to his riches in Christ Jesus. My God shall supply. My God shall take care of me. My God is with me no matter what I walk through. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake sake you so contentment then is comes from the inside not the out let's keep moving discontentment says if I only had another job if I had another house oh I'm tired of this spouse that's always nagging I'm going to trade you in on a new model be careful sir because if you trade her in you got two yards you got to mow now if only you treated me right. If only I had one of those or two of those or ten of those or a hundred thousand of those, right? Then it would all my life would be right. No, sir, it wouldn't. Because see, what you're trying to fulfill can't come from out here. Because in every one of us, God has put what I call a God vacuum. Meaning the Creator created us with a desire to worship. And so when that desire in me, I'm trying to fulfill it from all the world, no, it was designed to be filled with God. I was designed to be a vessel to carry God and His presence in me. And if I try to fill that void in my heart, my life, with something else to find fulfillment, then, then I, I come up short. There's always something wrong. I don't know about you, but I tried to fulfill my life with everything in the world that you can fulfill it with. You can try the money, and you're still empty. You can try drugs. You can try relationships. You're still empty. Because nothing but God can bring contentment. Nothing but God can bring fulfillment in our hearts and in our lives. Contentment comes from focusing on the Lord. You got to focus on the God as being sovereign, meaning He has all undisputed authority. That's a place to shout. Our God has all authority in heaven and earth. <clears throat> and therefore, I must give my life to Him. And when I do that, then it releases, it releases God's fulfillment in my heart and in my life. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto treasure hid in a field. That which a man has found. And when he finds it, he hideth, and for joy therein he goes and he sells all that he has, and he buys the field. 
Can I tell you that the Lord is a precious treasure? And when you find and, and get the revelation of, of the great sovereign God, the master, sustainer, and creator of the universe, God. And when you find God, he's a treasure. And here's what the scripture says. The kingdom of God is like this. When you find him, you sell out. You sell out. You give everything that you got. You sell all your possessions so that you can own the one treasure, God. Yeah. Lord, I'm selling out because there ain't nothing else in the world. You are it. And when I find the treasure, God, nothing else. Paul said, I count it all as rubbish. He said, in one scripture, one translation, he says, I count everything in the world like dung. That's doo-doo. For the excellency that's in Jesus Christ. In other words, the kingdom of God is like a man who found the treasure. And when he found God, nothing else mattered. He gave it all for the glory of God. How many of you know? Amen. Man. Man, that was such good news 30-something years ago, man. I just couldn't, I couldn't hardly believe it. Were y'all like me? When, when I, I started reading about the treasure, God, and that some kind of way, this God loved me, and he wanted to be part of my life. And, and I looked at my life, man. I, I was down there. You know what I'm saying? I didn't qualify, I didn't think. I didn't know I could be in the Jesus Club because I was in all the other kind of clubs. I didn't know that I could be. But when I got the revelation that, that the Lord wanted to live in my heart, and He wanted to be part of my life, and God wanted me to join the body of Christ and, and be part of His kingdom, when I got it, I just rejoiced. And yes, I do qualify. And yes, He does love me. And the Lord accepts me just as crazy as I am. He loves me just like I am. And he says, you can come. You're welcomed. You are accepted in the beloved. And man, when I found the good news of Jesus Christ, I accepted him as Lord and Savior. And, and I sold out to him. I sold all my worldly possessions so that I could have the, the one prize, the one treasure, who was God himself that brought fulfillment and satisfaction in my heart. I had tried to do it with the world. I was still empty. Something was missing. I asked myself all the time, what in the heck is the purpose of life? What in the world. Do, 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 do. What am I doing in a place called planet earth? What is the plan? What is the vision? What is the purpose? Something's missing in my life. Man, and end up in doggone jail cell doing all the crazy stuff. And in the jail cell, God himself met with me who's not limited by fences or walls, man. And, and he's not ashamed of you when you're in your muck and in the mire. And the Lord came into my heart. When he came into my heart, I vowed to vow to him. By the way, to whom much has been forgiven, they'll love much. And I vowed to him. I said, God, I have run hard for the devil. But I swear to God that I will run harder for you. Come on now. And as a result, here we are serving the Lord 30-something years later. And here all of you wonderful, precious people are right here. And here's the good news. The good news is, is the treasure is God. And we have met the Lord. We've, we've, we've gone into that field. And we have found the treasure. 
We quickly covered it up because we didn't want anybody to go steal our treasure. We ran home. We sold everything we had so we could buy the field that we know has God, the treasure. And we bought that field. And now we have the treasure of God in our lives. Praise you, Lord. It's a miracle. We are saved, guys. We're saved. And we didn't look like we would qualify because on the outside we didn't look too good. But the Lord loves sinners. The Lord cares about people. That's why you can never get snooty-nosed. Did I make that up? Maybe so. I don't even know if that's a word. You know what snooty nose is. You know. <laughs> because God loves all people. We can never make a judgment towards another precious person because God loves all people. Can I get an amen? Here's what the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 12, 1 through 4. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, chapter 11 in Hebrews is the Hall of Fame of Faith, which is all the the, the patriots that have gone before us and live by faith to serve God. And, and you can see them, no, uh, uh, Noel's in there, Abraham, Sarah, all the great people of faith. And by the way, when you look at their lives, they weren't perfect. So it wasn't because they were perfect in their lives. The common denominator was this, even though some of them did sin and some of them made terrible mistakes like Samson and those but they were justified because they believed God. They really believed in God. And so as a result of believing in God, the Bible says righteousness was imputed unto them or accounted unto them. And so right now we're going into chapter 12, which it says, Wherefore, got to see what it's there for. And, and it goes on to talk about the Old Testament saints that have died before us. And now they're in heaven in the grandstands looking down in what I think is the stadium called planet earth. And they're watching us live our life out with all the angelic angels. Can you see it? A word picture. And so that's what the scripture is teaching. That we're compassed about with all those that have gone before us that are watching us, they're witnesses, uh, they're watching us in our lives. So because we're running the race for the glory of God in the kingdom of God, the Bible says to do some things to be all we can be for the glory of God. You ready to see what that is? So let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily Beset us, and leave it on this scripture because I want to talk about it for a second. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, here, here's what the scripture says. The scripture says that there are some things in our life that is not necessarily sin, but it is a weight. It is a hindrance. It's some kind of thing in our life that's keeping us back. That's keeping us from moving forward. And I'm looking at Sean on the front row right here. And I'm going to use him for a little illustration. Would it be all right if we use our brother today? Uh, brother Sean McCants, would you stand up? Big Sean. Now look, we've done a whole lot of work together. Yes. Hours and hours. Days and days. Sean would come to work, and he would wear these weights. Let me see if you got them. No, I don't think you got them today. He put five-pound weights on his ankles. And we're climbing scaffolds. We're up on the roof. <laughs> I said, Sean, we're already tired. We're already working like really working and we're tired what in the heck are you doing with five pound weights on your ankles on the scaffold 
up on the roof. And Sean, I say, Sean, you need to take those weights off. But I'm going to tell you right now, he never would take the weights off. And so when I saw this, let us run the race that is set before us. And, and, and let us uh, lay aside every five-pound weight that's hindering me when I, when I walk. <laughs> I, all I could think about was Sean with weights. And I thought about us running the life for Jesus Christ. And I thought about what is in our lives that's hindering us. What is holding us down? What is keeping us back? Because the Word of God says, whatever it is, we're not saying you're not saved. We're not saying you're not on your way to heaven. We're just simply saying that you can't be all that God has called you to be as long as you've got that character defect in your life. As long as you won't let go of some kind of addiction, some kind of bondage, some kind of struggle in your life. As long as you keep holding on to the world. You can't move forward with God. And then he said, he said, get rid of the weights. Get rid of the sin that's besetting you. And then he said, let us run with patience or endurance. That word patience, I, I took the liberty to read it up. It's not a passive patience like you're sitting around, you know, I'm, I'm going to wait on uh, you guys, and so let me just sit here and wait on you. All right, just wait. This patience is an aggressive warrior patience. It's a fighter patience. This patience here is, is if there's something in my way, I'm going to... Be patient enough to move it out of my way. It's going to, it, this patience rises up and is ready to fight, is ready to do war. That's the kind of patience that's here. How many of you know that you got to have it on your mind? You got to be really uh, uh, willing to fight the good fight called faith, and we can keep. All right, so then it says verse two. So here's the three steps. Stop, look, and fix. So when you got discontentment in your life, when you're, when you're arguing, you're fussing, you're fighting, there's schism, there's division, there's chaos, and you are the one that's making it happen, mummering, griping, complaining, then here's what the Scripture says. you got to stop that. You got to check and see what you're looking at. And then you got to fix your eyes on Jesus. And here's what the scripture. Now, look, I gave you a little handout before I read this, real quick. Do you see this? See the opportunity? Get it up right now. Opportunity. Tell me what it says. Opportunity. Opportunity is what? Nowhere. Opportunity is nowhere? Oh, what you say, brother? <laughs> Opportunity is nowhere. Missed, what Bible are you reading from? Missed, All right, now I'm cutting up. <laughs> that's what my, re my reading skills, brother Ricky. No, brother, please. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it ain't the reading skills. <laughs> it's how you see things. It's what you perceive. Because you can read this sentence right here. And it could say, opportunity is nowhere. Or you could read it again and say, opportunity is now here. They're both brothers. I'm sorry, that was a little trick question. Okay, and, and a newcomer too. So I repent to you, newcomer. Okay, please come back next Sunday, okay? All right. You're about to leave. He's about to leave. <laughs> If you're offended, don't be offended. Wait, stop it. Stop being offended. Take authority over offense. 
Don't, I, look, I'm not going to say everything right, and you catch me on the day, I might manifest on you or something, man. Give, give me some grace. If I have a bad day in the stock market, look, man, you got stocks, and you got one bad day in the stock market, you don't sell that day, right? It's the trend that you sell on, right? Now, if I got a trend in my life, you can put your hand up like this and move on. Make sure you put your hand up, and I'll know that everything's all right. You just got to go. So... <laughs> How many of our African Americans know that? Uh, all right, so I was raised in African American church. All right, I already know how to leave. <laughs> when you when you get ready to leave, you just put your hand up. That way, the preacher knows you ain't offended. Right? <laughs> all right, praise God. Are y'all alive in here? Yeah. All right. Wait, are we doing church? Yeah. Are we learning anything all together? I'm learning too. We've got to change our hearts and not allow our hearts to be conditioned or formed by the world. We've got to let God's Word form us and make us who we are. We can't be conformed to the world. So the Bible says, I've got a couple more scriptures and we're, we're moving. So look, look, looking unto Jesus, and who is He? He's the author and finisher of our faith. And what did he do? For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Two more scriptures and we're going home. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. And watch this. Where's the battle? Lest you be wearied in your own minds. Listen, guys, I, and look, man, I've been trying to make sure I don't repeat myself over and over because you'll come and say, man, all he does is teach about what you think. But the, but the problem is, is, is that our thinking has got to become right before we can walk in victory in our lives. Jesus has already done everything. Now we have to hear his word and think His Word, and live His Word, and when we do, it causes us to walk in victory, but it has to do with your mind. So you, our minds have got to constantly change. So right thinking leads to right living. If my thinking is wrong, my life is wrong. So we, we've got to change our thinking to think like God thinks. We've got to let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, Right? And we've got to renew our mind by the spirit of our mind, is what Ephesians chapter 4 says. And, and so the scripture continually teaches that our mind has got to be right. You've got to make your mind, mind. So Jesus, uh, he says this, make sure you focus on him that endured all that he did for you at the cross, being crucified. Because when you're living your life, there will be a time that you're crucified. There will be a time that you will have struggles. You will walk through some hard things in your life when the storm of life comes. And when it comes, the Bible clearly teaches that you're not to faint, not to become weary in your mind. Demons take advantage of weak-minded people. Demons... I'm going to say it one more time. Take advantage of people that choose to be weak-minded. You got to be strong-minded. You got to be strong in your mind. You got to be able to be uh, stable and secure. Watch this. For God has not given me a spirit of fear, but here's the spirit, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Here's what God's given us. He's given us love, power, and a sound mind. If I got fear in my life, God didn't give me that spirit. That came from somewhere else. Perfect love casteth out all fear. What am I saying? 
I'm saying that God did not give any of us a spirit of fear. And if there's a spirit of fear in our life, it didn't come from God. And you got to take authority over that spirit of fear. God gave you love. God gave you power. And God gave you a sound mind. Come on now. You can't be wearied and faint in your minds. You have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. So when you're going through something, focus your mind on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. When you're mom- and griping and complaining and causing chaos and, and nagging in your life, you got to stop. You got to look at Jesus. You got to look at what your perception is, what your belief is, what you're doing. You got to look at what you're doing. And then you, you've got to fix your eyes on Jesus. Listen, let me tell you something. You got a pornography problem, sir? I don't, I don't know about the ma'ams. I know about the sirs. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Medea, for straightening me out. Okay. You got to stop. You got to look. And you got to fix your eyes on Jesus Christ on the cross dying for you. Let me tell you something, it's going to be hard to lust when you see bleeding Jesus with the nails driven into his hands. By the way, he was naked too. So if you want to look at something naked, look at Jesus being crucified on the cross for you. An innocent man that knew no sin, no, nor God, or any, ever anything uh, in his life that deserved death, that deserved the, the punishment that he received for us. And the only reason why he did it is he did it for you. Listen, let me tell you something. When you think about Jesus and who he is and what he's done for you, the treasure, what it does is, is it does something in your heart. Compassion. And love comes into your heart. Uh, 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 an overwhelming. I'm trying to just explain that the way that I overcome sin in my life is I can't do it with thou shalt not. Because the, there's no power in thou shalt not. But there's power when I see Jesus, an innocent man, doing something for me that he didn't deserve, that I deserve. And when I see him doing that beat, the cat whip with those, those uh, that steel in the end of that whip, that when it hit his side, it went, oh, stuck. And it, oh, Y'all remember the passion? And you saw him beat where he's not even recognizable anymore. And, And you did that so that I could overcome lust. You did that so that I could overcome addiction. You did that so that I wouldn't have to be in bondage anymore. You did that for me to deliver me and set me free. Jesus Christ, I love you. I've sold everything I got. I bought the field because I know Jesus is in the field. I'm going to get a hold of Jesus Christ. I'm going to serve Jesus with all my heart, with everything that's within me, because he alone is worthy to be praised. Shout somebody. Stand to your feet. Jesus, Jesus, just say, Lord, help me not to gripe, not to complain, not to nag, not to cause chaos or confusion. Lord Jesus, I pray that your strength, your love, your acceptance, your satisfaction, your peace, your fulfillment will live in me. Help me, Lord, in my perception that my eyes will always focus on you so that I can be who you've created me to be. Say, Lord, I ask you to forgive me for not serving you with all my heart. I believe Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior 
of my life. And I give Him glory. Come on, give the Lord a great big shout in this place. Hey, I love all of you guys. Let me speak the blessing. Father, I thank you so much for Miracle Place Church and all of our members, this great, great, great family. God, I hold us up before you, and I ask you to cause increase, cause favor, cause blessing. Lord, everywhere we go, cause it to multiply. Wherever our feet tread, you give us the land. Now, Lord, bless Miracle Place Church, all of our people and our families. Bless us now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all the church receives it. Say amen. Amen.